So I will speak about the question of steering progress in artificial intelligence today and why that is so important. And I want to start with a question that people have been very concerned about since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And that's what are the effects of new technologies on the economy? Well, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we know that there was one story that was very popular, the so-called Luddite story. And the Luddite story was that new technologies destroy jobs and basically that we are all doomed because we lost our jobs as artists and weavers and spinners and we will never be as well off again. Well, today we know that that story doesn't quite capture reality. And if we look at what is more or less the consensus opinion among elites worldwide, the storyline is something like the following. New technologies automate away simple, low paying, oldish jobs, but we create new, more exciting and higher paying jobs. Now, along the way, there are unfortunately some transition costs, but there is a strong belief that ultimately a rising tide will lift all boats. Well, economists, and Darren was actually one of the leading thinkers on this question, have come to understand in recent years that that is not quite the full story either. So what is the truth? The truth is that new technologies can and do lead to significant redistributions of income. And for any new technology, there is actually an entire spectrum of possible outcomes. Technologies can be labor biased, they can be roughly neutral, they can be capital biased. And if we look at the overall effects of that on labor and capital, we can actually split this spectrum into two uh, large parts on the left, technologies would be labor using. That means overall, they increase labor demand. Once a technology becomes too biased towards capital or other things, we can call it labor saving. And that implies that it will in equilibrium lower wages and employment. So the crucial question for any new technology is how labor biased versus capital biased it is and overall, if we are interested in the technology making workers better off, we need the technology to be labor using. Let me be a little bit more tangible and um, give you some examples. So one example of a labor biased technology I can think of are ride sharing services. Now we know there's all kinds of problems with the way how they have been regulated, but overall, I think there is still the positive aspect that they have actually created a lot of jobs. They have really used a lot of labor. Another example of a technology in a similar sector that would probably have the opposite effects, that would be labor saving, and that would most likely reduce equilibrium wages and equilibrium, empl equilibrium employment would be autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles would do away with all the jobs created by ride-sharing services and perhaps many more and are bound to lead to downward pressure on wages and employment. Now I should emphasize that a similar spectrum of possibilities holds not only for labor as a whole but also for different categories of labor and one aspect that we have been particularly concerned about and Darren had some really interesting graphs on that, is the bias towards lower skilled workers. So if a technology is biased towards lower skilled workers, the way that economists use the vocabulary is it will actually help lower skilled workers. It will increase their market returns. But unfortunately, so far, a lot of automation in AI was biased against lower skilled workers and has hurt them. 
So in the following, I want to take a quick look at the data. But before looking at the data, I thought it is useful uh, to digress into how economists think about the job, mar job market more broadly. If you listen to public discussions, you often hear a focus on how many jobs are created or lost by a certain technology. But economists believe that this is really an imperfect guide to labor market conditions. And economists prefer to focus on the level of wages or even more ideally on demand for jobs. So why are, is the level of wages a better guide to what's going on in labor markets than the number of jobs created or lost? Well, the reason is simple. Since most people try to find work no matter what, or as economists call it, since labor supply is very inelastic, wages offer a much better picture of what's going on in the labor market. So that means if we have labor saving innovations, they are ultimately not reflected in jobs, but they are rather reflected in wages. And when we see declining wages, that is an indicator that our technologies have hurt workers. So let me show you a graph that decomposes the total output earned in the United States into three different categories. The top category, the yellow bar, is the so-called capital share of income. That's basically all the returns earned by capital. The bottom two together is what is generally called the labor share of income. And what you can see is that the bottom two bars together, they have kind of declined a little bit from slightly above 60% to slightly below 60% over the past half century. Now, what this graph does though, it, is, it decomposes the labor share into what is, what is earned by what I wanna call raw labor. That's the blue uh, area. And what I want to call the human capital share, which is the total returns, the total excess returns earned by college graduates. And what you can see is, even though the labor share as a whole has declined just a little bit to slightly below 60% over the past half century, the uh, earnings of non-college uh, educated workers have declined much more rapidly. And uh, the big winners of uh, the change over the past half century have really been college degree holders. Uh, now, if there is large redistributions of income, one of the interesting questions is, where is the income going that the losers are losing? And on this graph, I'm showing you the income shares of the top 1% of the population and the top 0.1%. What you can see is that the income of the top 1% has more than doubled over the past five decades the income of the top 0.1% has more than tripled over the past half century. So that means there have really been these significant redistributions of income away from the lowest skilled workers in particular and up in particular to the elites. So what I want to focus on next is how do we respond to these phenomena? The traditional focus uh, of policy in responding to rising inequality has been to focus on more redistribution. So the idea is we let the market do its job, whatever that may be, and then we tax and redistribute and generate a more uh, equal distribution uh, through that mechanism. Now, in practice, our tax and social insurance systems have actually become less progressive over the past four decades. So that means our tax system, our social insurance system has reinforced the inequality generated by the market system. And uh, it has become increasingly questionable if redistribution in itself can uh, generate the more equal uh, distribution 
uh, that we would like to experience. So a new focus that people have started to talk about and that I want to focus on today is instead to focus on pre-distribution. I want to emphasize that this is complementary to redistribution. I don't want to do away with uh, redistribution, but in some ways focusing on pre-distribution and in particular in the context of AI may be more promising. So what is pre-distribution? Pre-distribution are measures that affect how the market itself distributes resources. So it affects market wages. And the key element for our purposes here, the key point that we want to relate to innovators in this domain is this question of whether our technological innovations are labor using or labor saving. So what I want to propose is that innovators can focus on labor using innovation or on more labor using innovation than they would otherwise. And they can actually do that with relatively small impact on their profits. So um, to all the mathematicians in the audience, uh, this is a well-known argument that comes from the envelope theorem. If we are maximizing for something so here in this graph, I am assuming that there is an innovator that maximizes profits and that has found uh, how much labor they need to use so that their profits are maximized. But at the maximum, uh, our objective functions, our profit levels are usually somewhat flat functions of uh, the variables uh, that we are maximizing with respect to. So it means we can actually vary how much we want to use labor for a little bit. Let me give you an example. We can use a little bit more labor than we would otherwise. And yes, our profits may decline, but they may do so just a tiny little bit. And that means we can focus on more labor using innovation with minimal impact on our profits. Now, um, let me also speak a little bit about longer term considerations, because I believe that in the context of AI, those are of crucial importance. Some, uh, including some people on this steering committee, are very concerned about uh, what has come to be called the AI control problem. So basically the notion that ever improving AI capabilities will make it more and more difficult for humans to control these smarter and smarter machines. They may outsmart us at some point. Well, we are not quite at that point, but from an economic standpoint, another version of the AI control problem has already arrived. I want to suggest that today's manifestation of the AI control problem is that AI gives rise to an ever more unequal human income distribution. Tomorrow's manifestation of the AI control problem may be about the distribution of resources between humans and AI agents. And on the right hand side of my slide, you can see that if we look at how many resources are being absorbed by humans versus AI, uh, there has been this huge divergence, this huge takeoff in the resources uh, going into AI systems. And if that path continues, then at some point we may really have to worry about the distribution of resources. But the question I want to pose is, how can we hope to deal with the future AI problem, if we, uh, the future AI control problem, if we can't even solve today's AI control problem? So let me uh, end with the following four questions that I want to pose to the committee. There are two questions that focus more on the technical dimension of AI. What innovations can we work on that are labor using, meaning that create jobs, especially for lower skilled workers? Second, what systems can we put in place to methodically identify such innovations? And then two questions that focus more on the organizational dimension. How can we affect the culture, the incentives of organizations, including of profit-oriented organizations, 
to take into account the labor market impact of their innovations? And how can we influence our broader culture in that direction to make labor using innovation cool? Thank you.